Acid Horizon fans, welcome back. This is our episode on existential psychotherapist, R.D. Lang. Before we get to our guest, Sasha, and our discussion of R.D. Lang's concept of ontological insecurity, just a few things. We have some great episodes coming up, an episode on transgender Marxism, also episodes on Hegel and Gothic Marxism. Now is a great time to subscribe to Acid Horizon. Jump on our Patreon for as little as $1. Check out our merch store. Check out our blogs. Also, check out some content that we have exclusively on that platform. Also coming up in the near future, we will have a seminar exclusively for our Patreon subscribers on the topic of Francois Laruelle and a newly translated essay by him. For now, let's talk about Artie Lang and let's get to the episode with Sasha. Welcome to Asset Horizon, the Fury podcast. Today, Will and I are joined by Sasha Warren. Sasha is an independent researcher in radical psychiatry, madness liberation, and contemporary forms of penality. He publishes mainly at unsoundmind.org, producing articles as well as public presentations, including his recent Mental Health in Crisis series, which we're going to link in the notes. We're planning on giving his work at Unsound Mind a more thorough treatment soon, as it's all essential reading for Radical Mental Health Scholarship today. But on today's episode, Sasha is here to help us bring some academic clarity to today's topic. The work of the psychiatrist R.D. Lang and the notion of ontological insecurity. Sasha, welcome to Acid Horizon. Thanks for having me. I've I've listened to your show since the episode on Reich and uh, I'm a big fan, so I'm really happy to be here. Absolutely our pleasure. So I guess let's start off with, I mean, who was R.D. Lang, I guess? I mean, but just to give some rudimentary biographical details, you know, 1927 to 1989, pretty uh, substantial figure in the uh, anti-psychiatry movement, starting off from traditional forms of psychiatry, working with people like you know, D.W. Winnicott in the Tavistock Clinic up in London. Uh, particularly had a quite a strong left turn, particularly after the, the, the main book we're writing, uh, reading today, which is The Divide Itself, and uh, part one of that particularly working alongside people like uh, Marcuse, uh, Kwame Ture, Gregory Batson, the Dialect of Liberation Conference in the mid-60s over up in uh, Camden Town, and um, was particularly interested in the ideas of person-centered psychology. So yeah, I guess one place to start before we jump into the content of this uh, work would be to talk about exactly what he's responding to like what are the tendencies in this profession that he's kind of ascending from in his literature and what are sort of the fundamental problems that he's going to address uh at least in this first section uh on ontological security this early section on ontological security that we read i guess that'd be a good place to start Sasha, do you, do, you, do you have anywhere where you can point us as to like what would be if there was like a primary methodological anxiety in Lang, why he needed to write this book? Like what would you sort of see that as? Um, I think he, he lays it out pretty early on um, his where he's trying to make an intervention um, in an earlier section in the existential phenomenological foundations for a science of persons, the first chapter. He says there, um, we, we're, we're going to be concerned with people who experience themselves as automata, as robots, bits of machinery, or as animals. Such persons are rightly regarded as crazy. Yet, why do we not regard a theory that seeks to transmute persons into automata or animals as equally crazy? I think that there's that's kind of where his intervention enters in. Um, and he gets really deep into it, I think, uh, and cl more clearly in the ontological insecurity section, and particularly when he starts teasing out these different, um, these different categories of anxiety that he starts to lay out. And I don't know if we want to jump that deep into the text at this point, but I feel like that's really where his, uh, his kind of ethical intervention comes in most strongly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's uh, fundamentally uh, a methodological intervention on the level of the orientation of you know, what is the object 
of the psychiatric study. And he, he's, he's pushing back on these very sort of more scientismic ways of seeing the patient in terms of what he would say, you, know, you need to be an objective person, objectively looking upon this person and seeing their behaviours, recording these bodily motions. And he's trying to undermine the sense of it, of the neutrality of that, specifically insofar as you know, his approach is to create a science of persons. We're talking about the science of, you know, psychiatry, psyche, sort of, you know, the science of the soul, was embodied in a, in, a, in a personal structure and the experience of personality that goes with it. You know, he, he says at one point in um in, in the, sort of the part preceding ontological insecurity, you know, we, we, we will always see subjectivity derided as mere subjectivity. And yet mere objectivity never gets the same sort of rap, including when we're dealing with, with persons who, I mean, it's, it's, it's implicit here that they are fundamentally a subject object. They are the, their subjectivity, their experience of themselves is what is at question in the science of persons and the science of personality and, of course, personality in what he would term disorder, at least at this time. And I guess in terms of the, about the ontology of persons, I'm just wondering sort of where Lang is taking the term ontological and what sense he's using it in. Yeah, he's, he's not, he's, he explicitly states that he's not trying to be a Heideggerian, Sartrean, fundamental uh, ontologist with phenomenological characteristics. But, you know, the, the book opens up with a, an articulation of schizophrenia as a clinical concept being related to a fundamental split between uh, an individual's relation with himself and with the world. And he's literally using the hyphenated uh, concept of being in the world, being at home in the world, in the Weltsein, right? So in a certain sense, he's, he's completely at least immersed in this tradition of existential psychology, um, existential phenomenological psychology, so like Binswanger, um, and his notion of ontology is going to be an attempt to really deeply invest in this concept of the person's relation to themselves in a relation. So like, uh, and one, like more Kierkegaardian folks will be able to identify that, that this sort of has a comparable notion to sickness on the death. And you're right, because in a footnote at the end of one of the chapters, he says, even the, 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 my treatment of schizophrenia um, is reliant entirely on um, this notion, uh, this Kierkegaardian notion of despair. But one thing that I want to touch on when we talk about a science of persons is um, two things. The, the first is that uh, he his concern is primarily that, uh, at least at this level, that psychopathology treats like unif- people that he believes to be unified like persons. Like he he believes that there's a fundamental fragmentation that is necessitated by the process like the methodological processes of psychopathology that leads to a machinic treatment of man that, that sees man as only a collection of, of somatic tendencies, right? So a lot like the subject under the medical gaze uh, in the clinic, right? Where the, the human being just becomes a surface where symptoms can manifest and so on. And he believes that psychopathology is predicated on a kind of dualism, a dualism that both sees man as person and man as organism, but that it it ends up because of the way in which we engage in these in, like they engage in these inquiries as practitioners falling into a monism that reduces one to the other. So it reduces the individual back to this concept of the organism, which he thinks in sort of a behaviorist, molecular kind of way, just folds back into this machinic treatment of of unified subjects in a very depersonalizing and frankly, uh, just to use you know more uh, careless language, de- a dehumanizing sort of way, conventionally understood as dehumanizing. I think that that might be one helpful way of understanding kind of the the core issue here. 
the next thing that I want to talk about, if only briefly, is there's this moment where Lang is discussing a psychiatrist, Kraepelin, Kraepelin who brings a uh, patient to students and displays that patient, all of their symptoms, tells the students exactly what, then this was a common practice. It was a common practice in 18th century German psych, proto-psychiatry for, for practitioners to bring, uh, to bring patients and to display them essentially as manifestations of broader symptomatic uh, tendencies within the general population of the hospital asylum. But particularly this individual, Kraepelin makes a, a comment about how the person he's going to display is fundamentally inaccessible. That the possibility of having a, a, a sort of analytical connection beyond just the identification of machinic tendencies is impossible. That, in fact, the information you receive is useless. And that's where Lang sort of jumps in and says, well, no, it's only useless precisely because of the way in which we're approaching patients. And this is when the problem of the monism of psychopathology starts to, to be brought out. And I was wondering if there was any sort of comment that we could make about the relationship between this practice and the broader concept of like psychiatric power, as we understand it kind of in, in Foucault's later work too. Because this, this concept of a relationship between uh, the displayed patient and the power of the of the of the psychiatrist that is only reinforced by that theatrical presentation sort of creates a political ecology that I think is is really comparable to to what we'll see in later critiques of power relations in the clinic. And I was wondering if either of you guys had a sort of similar approach or a, a sort of comparable lights uh, going up in your head when you read that. For sure, I I think this is one of the this is one of the places where Lang really shows um, the the value of his intervention because what he's doing is he's describing not psychiatric knowledge, not a patient considered an abstract, but he's describing how how clinical knowledge is formed in a really concrete way, and he describes like early on like we have to get to some basics here. We have to say when you're describing a patient and when you're describing any person at all, you have a language. And for him, he says that the thought is the language. So it's not adequate for him to say that, oh, I said one thing, but I really meant another because, well, you said the thing and that's what you meant. He also describes what he calls at one point a behavioral field. I think that's a really important concept here that there's a field where things are happening and there's a manner of approach on the one hand, and that could be, for instance, he describes someone speaking. You can you can approach that speaking in two different ways, at least. There's probably more as well. In the one sense, you can break it down into um, into you know decibels and um, uh, information about the tonality, whatever. You can objectify it in all these different ways, or you can listen to what the person is trying to say. And that's an entirely different way of approaching the speaking subject. So when he starts to describe this this episode with with Kraepelin, he describes how the behavioral field, all the behavior within a behavioral field is going to some extent be not necessarily determined, but conditioned by the behavioral field that's constructed. So when you put a patient up in the middle of a classroom and you say, you know, speak or do the symptom, show them show them who you are. Uh, in a sense, you're you're producing that symptom in a specific context. And it it might not the same, you know appeal or demand might be met with something completely different in a different context. And so he, Kraepelin believes or talks about how he's producing this objective information, but it's very clearly, I think, Lang pops that bubble of neutrality and demonstrates like there's no possible way of arriving at knowledge about psychopathology in a value neutral way or in a context that's not already to some extent predetermined by the doctor patient relationship which is you know, inherently a hierarchical one. So it's really the doctor is, is preparing that field and preparing for the way that knowledge is going to, to come to them. I, I think that's absolutely fantastic and a, a great analysis because it just reminded me of the figure of the hysteric in 19th century English proto-psychiatry, or I guess at this point, at that point in the 19th century, uh, 
but it doesn't the 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 point is i think that the the figure of Craplin's patient also becomes a focal point of resistance to the like do you want me to show you the symptom i'll show you the symptom right what was fantastic about Craplin's patient is it's useless only because Craplin refuses to listen to it right the the voice of psychiatric power says like you will speak and you will contribute to this archive of self-referential uh, knowledge, but the content of what you're saying has to be fed through all of these uh, non-discursive formations such that it can only reinforce my position as the doctor in this room, these positions as to be doctors, and your position as the patient. And the patient is always probably, well, what, what do you want from me? Are, 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 like, do you think I'm, I'm a whore? You know, do, uh, am I stupid? Are you stupid? And there's this remarkable uh, thread of, of resistance that Craplin is completely blind to because it has no utility to this not value neutral science. So I, yeah, I think that's just a, that's just a fantastic way to put it. Agreed. And maybe just to give a bit of clarity to the, the Craplin's patient here, I can read out what Craplin's patient said when you know this patient is you know dragged into not simply a classroom, but a lecture theatre and is sort of just left there and has to be examined by Craitman for all these students. And just to give one example, um, so Craitman says, when asked his name, he, the, the, the patient, screams, what is your name? What does he shout? He shuts his eyes. What does he hear? He does not understand. He understands not. How, who, where, when, what does he mean? When I tell him to look, he does not look properly. You there, just look. What is it? What is the matter? Attend. He attends not, I say. What is it then? Why do you give me no answer? Are you getting impudent again? How could you be so impudent? I'm coming, I'll show you. You don't whore for me. You mustn't be smart either. You're an impudent, lousy fellow. Such an impudent, lousy fellow I've never met with. See, beginning again, you understand nothing at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all does he understand. If you follow now, he won't follow. Will not follow. Are you getting still more impudent? Are you getting impudent still more? How they attend, do they attend? And so on. He's mimicking Craplin's gaze. As, as, as you're saying, Sasha, about the linguistic capacity for this, it's, it's structured because uh, uh, Lang invokes Wittgenstein in the matter of a language game. The patient themselves, the unity of the patient, the patient as person is not part of the language game. And therefore, they are not part of any element of the script in the theatre that the, the psychiatrist has written for the patient, the part that they are to play. Is the patient rejecting the script entirely in the sense of wanting a new script? Or is he rejecting the very structure of the theatre such that a script has to be given in advance? I guess um, giving a kind of a hint of, sort of the, the possible like schizoid artos or critique that could come towards Lang is, is it fair to read the patient as wanting a game that better suits their place in it? Or do they not want to be a part of this scripted scenario at all, even if they, this, this, the ontology of this script was, was changed? Is this patient wanting a better script in terms of the, the very traditional structure of the theatre of, you know, a directing script, a transcendental subject that kind of scripts the whole thing in advance and directs it and you're just, a, your body is just um, motioning according to that script? Or is it more of what Arto would call a theatre of cruelty, where this distinction between the bygone director, this, this grand self hovering above things, is completely annihilated and everyone's just in this grand mix of together in which the imminence of the, the theatre is the production of all these bodies in an unseparated motion in which the play is, is conducted. But anyway, the, the, Arto, the Arto critique cannot really cover any further, I guess, until we, we get into the, the idea of ontological insecurity. It's the security of the self. We've already gestured about this all the time about the person is the centre of Lang's intervention in psychology, the idea of rather than splitting a person up into these tripartite parts, id, ego, superego, these bodily motions, you know, in order to have the idea of a self that becomes schizophrenic, a self that splits into the, the schizoid, the schizoid personality, you first need a unity in order for it to be split. That's the fundamental intervention so far. I think this is one of the more obscure concepts in the text, which is strange because it's it's in some ways it's the centerpiece or it's the central subject that's that's undergoing all these transformations. But um, I don't know if it comes out entirely clearly. He says early on that just being is all that a man is. Um, he does use the word experience a lot, 
in the initial paragraphs where he starts to describe what the self is. You can see it like four or five times in a row. He uses the word experience and he uses the word relation too. So you can tell that those are important concepts for him and that they fit in some some uh, primary way into the concept. But I do think, having read this again, that it almost feels like there's just a, there's just an axiomatic character to this self. It's just something he he has to assume. He has to push the, put this this forward as the subject in order for all of his other interventions to make sense and to work. But he doesn't seem that concerned um, with trying to prove that it's it's the correct character or something like that. He kind of takes a an approach of saying like, you know, everybody feels this, uh, feels this self. And so everybody can feel this self breaking down or splitting and all these things. I, I don't know if that's true, but it, se- it felt to me like that was something that he was presupposing. I don't know if you both got that impression as well. Yeah, I think one of the one of the problems here is that there are like seriously complicated subjective presuppositions that hold up his phenomenological framework that without them, I don't think the the project as he's formulated would f- function. And I was talking about this, gosh, probably at 3 a.m. So I was probably like, and I was just posting on the internet about it. But there's this moment where he has a fascinating sympathy for Freud, who he otherwise doesn't seem to have much interest in even covering there are only passing references to to psychoanalysis even in the the entire first part he argues that freud is attempting to discover something new is attempting to find a a new way into the pathological problems of contemporary civil organization but in order to do that he's constrained by an entire 150 years of psychiatric practice and methodologies of subject excavation. And in order to do that, he has to carry with him a lot of problems. In some ways, Lang carrying the unified uh, Husserlian or, uh, you know, Ponty style uh, subject of perception, he also has to carry with him this this sort of unified sense of presence that everyone knows that no one can deny um so in a sense uh rd lang has a has a really really dogmatic image of thought (laughs) that then has to be split apart by this by these risks of of fracture and fragmentation and there's this other problem too that we talked about a little bit uh, briefly up top a little bit where He's, for the right reasons, and in an almost kind of, in ways that echoed a lot of uh, critiques like Illich and uh, Foucault on the breaking down of the human body to the most minute, to the most mechanical, right, to the fiber of the muscle and so on. He, He has this fear of fragmentation, and I understand that fear of fragmentation at the level of just somatically breaking down the person so as to lose uh, the forest for the trees, right? Um, But he has that same concern at the level of experience as well. Uh, Something that terrifies R.D. Lang is the very existence of the partial object. Uh, He can't can't look it in the face. Um, And this comes through in his bifurcation between the secure, the ontologically secure person, and the insecure person, uh, where disharmony and discontinuity and fracturedness seem to be the, the kind of defining traits of insecurity. But I'm going to hand it over, um, at least to, to Adam, to briefly introduce the concept of ontological security, and then we can get into you know more fruitful and thorough critiques of this thing. Yeah, I mean, I I just wanted to sketch out because there's there's many different senses of the self as we've already gone over in what Lang is trying to do. And to some extent, the self, or well, he even says the self is a bad term for it as he's starting off in in part one. Where he says, you know, the idea of a self is an impersonal abstraction. It's all about I and you, okay? But he does end up talking about the self. But in in some sense, the self or the I is a presupposition. It's a condition of possibility of schizophrenia in that it's needed for schizophrenia 
to occur because there must be something that splits, at least in his view and his clinical views of his time of schizophrenia. But there's also a sense in which the self him is ontologically primary, not simply on the epistemic grounds, but it actually really is in our experience. We must understand ourselves as a rigidly authentic, not rigid, but an authentic, self-composed, self-identical I, and then everything else is, everything else is just contingent. But there's a third sense in which sometimes it seems almost as if the I is a product of childhood development for him, such that one becomes an I by custom. One becomes accustomed to thinking of oneself as an I. And here we have these sort of tensions between, let's say, I don't know, a Descartes, Kant and Hume and all of these different versions of the self popping up here. And if you'd like to transition to the idea of ontological insecurity, I think it'd be very interesting to talk about how Lang describes how we become accustomed to becoming a self or to seeing ourselves as a self. And it's all based in one fundamental practice, which is the ability to keep secrets and to lie about oneself such that something is held back. He starts talking about how children eventually realize they can hold things back from their parents. They can keep things private. Privacy is the root of selfhood because you learn how to put a barrier and everyone eventually becomes accustomed to putting up these barriers, holding themselves back. What is customary to keep to oneself, the custom of privacy, then becomes the experience of selfhood on a developmental level. No longer transcendental. You don't need the transcendental unity of the subjects like you'd have for Kant. You don't even need the ontological in itselfness of you know, sort of the, um, the I in Descartes. All you get is the experience of the custom of being a self in the practice of keeping secrets. And I think this is a very, like, he doesn't develop it very much, but this idea of the seek, the custom and practice of keeping secrets and secrecy is the root of all selfhood. I was wondering if um, uh, what, what your thoughts on are on that collectively. I'll just say that there's this strange interplay in Lang between inner and outer and surface and interiority that doesn't ever really get resolved. And it's somewhat puzzling the way he tries to tease these out and use them in different ways. So here, right, interiority is, is, a, is a, an attribute of the sane person, of the person who's whole and has an inner life, and it's separate from other people's inner lives. And so that's, this, that's a sign of having some sort of stability or something like that. But at other times, and in other texts, like the politics of experience, for instance, he talks about schizophrenia or the psychotic break as an inner voyage and that they know the interiority better than anyone else and they actually understand depth the depths of inner experience uh of the likes of which no one else you know has ever seen but then at the same time he also talks about some cases like one of the cases he describes at the end of this chapter where he says the whole thing is on the surface he says this case of the woman who needed to validate her experience uh you know through others or whatever her case is entirely on the surface. It's a totally superficial problem. And it, it, there's, it's not an interior problem. Or if it is an interior problem, it's one that has to be understood through the exterior. <laughs> so I, I don't have an answer to any of this. I just think it's curious or it's odd how he, he, he uses them. He uses interiority and exteriority a lot. And they seem to be very important concepts for him. But he never, I don't, I don't believe he ever sets down in a kind of, axiomatic way what those actually signify for him um, beyond these these talking about these specific practices like having the capacity to hold secrets or something like that part of what's interesting about lang is there's this question of like domain and access so we have crapelin's patient who is completely inaccessible that the patient is walled off to, to this to this realm of the same. But at the same time, part of what defines sanity is understanding that one has a kind of limited sovereignty over oneself and that one can't apprehend others in the way one apprehends oneself, right? So the other figure would be the case study of James, a man who, who articulated an understanding of others that was machinic, and sort of broke down his wife, those he came into contact with, and even Dr. Lang himself in the same way that he broke himself down as, as a machinic series of, of, of inputs and outputs. And that, to Lang, signifies a remarkable kind of insanity because it violates the rule that we each understand each other as we would understand ourselves. 
or like we understand that we have an under we understand that the other person in, in an interaction has an understanding of themselves that there is this interiority so part of it too is that there's this kind of strange game of sovereignty it's like okay where where does your psyche get to claim its like domain and it reminds me of the oldest understanding of madness which is for one to believe oneself to be king for someone else to be to be subjects to your to your analytic eye or judgment and i think this is just one of the longest holdovers of the oldest echoes of the proto psychiatric tradition that again even when we talk about old forms of unreason where it's inaccessible completely sovereign to to the to the realm of reason to, and then to the realm of sanity there's these games of access where it's a question of where one can wander in their understanding of the other and the and their understanding of themselves so i think maybe now we can start to to sort of maybe break down the differences between security and insecurity do you do you, do either of you have have a, a way you want to do that to approach that yeah so before we move on to ontological insecurity as such i mean we've been using these words sanity insanity and these aren't ontological statuses so much as they are statuses of, of knowing conferred upon certain people based on the criterion and uh, lang gives us a really great example of a well, he gives us his the definition of sanity or how you know, how one can test. So sanity or psychosis is tested by the degree of, of conjunction or disjunction between two persons where the one is sane by common consent. This is where the idea of custom comes in again. It's that all psychotic labelling is a clash. And it's about it's a clash against who can be trusted, in a way. What, who's, who has the common consent of being able to be a self, to have secrets, let's say. And I, I, I was wondering about this, the economy of secrecy that forms selfhood, the customs of the practices of selfhood for, for Lang. Because it seems to be, so I describe it as a potty training of the self. The child will tell their parent everything, you know, they will, to the extent that the, eventually the parent has to sort of, you know, just block it, put, put them in like, you know, identity nappies or something. And then eventually the child learns to hold it in, and give themselves to the world, present themselves in, in an appropriate manner, filtered through the appropriate, you know, holes, channels, you know, plumbings, pipes, etc. It seems like it's it's all about the process of managing the ability to give oneself or to go to go outside of oneself. Lang, in his uh, second preface to this book, written about seven years after he finished it, he does say that normality is the abdication of ecstasy, and there's an economy here of, of holding oneself in to be a self means to it's fundamentally repressive, and, and and Freud could quite easily say, anal retentive. It it is the process of holding oneself in and knowing when, knowing when to shit and when not to shit. It's, it this custom of selfhood as being a practice of secrecy and holding one's own, holding oneself in, it seems to ground the very ontological notions of insecurity here. Because some people can't do this. Some people struggle to hold secrets. Some people don't have, haven't got the haven't been accustomed to being a self. And so they have ecstatic moments. They get out of themselves. They get out of their heads. They divide themselves into personas. They expend themselves in all these different ways that aren't customary. And this comes into the idea of sanity as being tested, where fundamentally someone will put forward themselves as this self. And someone will say, no, you're not. So I'm, I'm Napoleon. No, no, you're not. Or you're Napoleon. No, I'm not. And then this is where the, the dialectic of mutual recognition, which grounds sanity, starts to break down. And I'm wondering about how this, the role of recognition in what Lang calls ontological security, how that functions and how power works through this notion of common consensus. Because he doesn't really, it's not Lang never goes into this. In this book, he doesn't. And he's, he's only 28 or so when he writes this. He's working under the supervision of other psychoanalysts in the similar structures he's making a great intervention but it's this, this one is sane by common consent i mean you know every, every foucauldian agambenian any kind of any and sort of right now is just <laughs> the, the ears are pricked up i just want to know what what you folks think about that <laughs> i mean there's a really like immediate way you can read it and i think that it it is kind of 
it, it has a feeling to me of being almost a tautology. It, you know, if if you decide that someone's the same person and there's a disjunction between them, then yes, the other person is insane. But of course, that doesn't. It, what, and this is something I think is really frustrating about Lang is if, if that's what he believes, he doesn't ever really do very well of describing how that situation came to be on a larger way. He's very good at describing a clinical encounter and how the clinical encounter is structured and how it can pre-structure the way that sanity and madness are going to be expressed uh, or classified. But he's not very good at saying where that comes from in a broader way uh, on a, on a sh- political sense. He's right, clearly he's speaking in an, a political register here when he says by common consent. That's a political language, a political discourse. But he doesn't do very well of saying, okay, now what's the process by which that cons- consent is uh, is made and um, taken in? Uh, I don't think he does that very well. And this brings also to the point that I think I felt most uncomfortable rereading this, the, the concept that I just, it really irked me and I didn't understand where he's coming from, uh, and I don't think he did very well of explaining at all. And that's this concept of people who have a low threshold. Uh, he talks about low threshold and thresholds of security in self. Um, and so, if you're if you're taking as the basis this this uh, relationship between this you know the person who people by common consent consider to be sane, and then the other person has this low threshold of security, I suppose, and is categorized as insane. But he, where does this threshold come from? What is the origin of this threshold? And what is the like status of this threshold? Because if you assume it's biological, I mean, Lang has just arrived at epigenetics. And, you know, there's this concept now, prodromal psychosis, where they think that they can suss out the expression of psychosis before it actually comes out. So you can look at children and you can say, uh, we are seeing some behaviors, patterns of behaviors that are syndromatic of the pre-stage of psychosis. So we're going to get them into a pre-treatment for this pre-psychosis, which I think is, you know, if you're using the language of risk and you're using the language of threshold and, and thinking about this risk as being prior to the actual expression of the thing you're talking about, I, I really think you run the risk of of adding fodder to these theories like that. And it's funny, I think he, in his case of anxiety, the first case of anxiety, that same woman who always needed the validation, he starts to suggest, I think, that this validate this need for validation comes from the threshold, her low threshold, comes from her dysfunctional relationship with her parents. And so he starts to develop a kind of developmental theory, a, a theory of childhood that created this low threshold. And it's at that exact point where he starts to really strongly distance himself from psychoanalysis. So he really doesn't want, he doesn't want to say, uh, I'm not just doing, you know, Freudian analysis in a different way. I'm actually doing my own thing. Uh, at least I read that into this, into this passage where he's like, talking about this woman and he says, you know, the reason why she has fantasies is, is definitely because she needs to validate her existential condition, not, not because of the demands of the, you know, the need for gratification or anything like that. But sorry, that's getting a little bit further off topic, but. Yes. I I think there's, there's a lot of truth to that, especially now, given that the legacies of psychoanalysis are sort of commonplace. It's even even as media tropes, you know, the idea that all psychology is tacitly Freudian. If you let like Slavoj Žižek talks about, you know, where people go to the psychoanalyst, and of course, you know, the first kind of resistance is trying to give the analyst what they want, and everyone starts, you know, everyone turns into a social worker about about themselves in a way. And you could definitely see that residual, so I guess, uh, use terms sort of creating a uh, the story of oneself, or like or fabulating for the last guitar in heads about the about about oneself as as this as this clinical subject, and you're entering into the language game that that sort of depersonalizes oneself from the standpoint um, of a subject and turns oneself into this, this psychiatric uh, or this psychoanalytic psychopathological case study. And I guess, I guess I, I've, I've been sort of, yeah, I've been, I've been maintaining the secrets of ontological insecurity for too long, holding it in. Let's, let's get into sort of the three ways in which this can manifest and it, which is fundamentally a three kinds of anxieties that tend to structure all these case studies that made of, of the clinical experiences of, of schizophrenia. And these are new, ca- somewhat new categories for Lang because I mean, Lang, Lang talks earlier on the book about how this project is about validating himself, really, and his own experience of himself as a, a practicing psychiatrist because 
he's looking at the the, the list of behavioral diagnostic uh, sort of patterns in in his textbooks, and he's not getting that in the way that coheres to any people he's treating because he's not treating them in the same way as Craig. He's not treating them as these collection of um, what he calls it processes, depersonalized uh, motions of, of, of behavior and exclamation, et cetera, et cetera. He has to you know, make these three new mechanisms of ontological insecurity, ontological disjunction within the self, such that they lead themselves to present themselves in a way which does not give them the, the assent of the commonality, but the entire medical practice as such. So I guess we want to stick to the, the first ones, but you know, begin where we begin and think about engulfment. Does if anyone uh, give me a, a lowdown on engulfment? Uh, again, this is this is where I think Lang, for me, like while I have like deep sympathies for the problem, the root problems he's addressing, I, I, I start to fall off quite heavily. But for engulfment, the way in which Lang describes it is as a sort of fundamental fear of losing one's autonomy and identity which the the comment that he uses is he again creates this bifurcation of a of a discourse between two individuals one who is sane and does not possess or is not invoked to have these anxieties and the other are in a conversation and there's a disagreement and one is saying one is say, uh the the subject believes that one is saying they just want to argue for the sake of domination to to win this argument whereas the individual who's on the other side who who lying casts into the realm of error is one who is arguing to preserve their existence and i think that's one helpful way of is of starting to understand um engulfment it's it's not just simply a a losing sort of one's autonomy and one's identity because that's it's not just a fear of being constrained or restrained it's also a fear of being apprehended it's a fear of it's a fear of being understood it's the risk of i think he he describes it as it's the risk of being loved or simply be, uh in being uh seen to be hated may be feared for other reasons, but to be hated as such is often less disturbing than to be destroyed, as it is felt through being engulfed by love. So, yeah. Um, so it's this need to remain at a a predisposition of hostility towards interpretation, and Lang sees it manifesting in a desire to be isolated out of a, a requirement for defense, for self-defense. I see it comparing in a lot of, and, and folding over in a lot of different ways to petrification, but that could just be a result of a misreading. I'm struggling to, to see why these two things are, are explicitly distinct, but we'll move on to, to the next form, which is, um, which is implosion. And because it has emptiness involved, I don't even know where to start. Im implosion to me felt like the the i think it's the in my view it's the least essential of the three i would actually go so far as to say that a lot of the langian i don't want to say the whole of the langian project but a lot of the langian project and its perspective can be seen in both its successes and failures by a by counterposing engulfment to petrification i think these are actually really two really different uh approaches and methods of approaching his work and engulfment i think is the weak one and i think it's the one that he ended up leaning on a lot heavier as he went on and i think that that was to his his detriment and it contributed to his lack of sincere political engagement with the world uh his claims as he went on that he's increasingly apolitical and the reason why i think that is this concept of engulfment I th it, it perhaps it is a logical consequence of his um, of his concept of self that he's developing as this as this whole thing. Um, so that's the only way I can imagine that he would consider love to be the greatest threat to this thing. That anything that includes a swallowing or uh, an, a total like blanketing over or falling into a, a maelstrom or something like that. These are the kinds of metaphors that come to mind when I think of engulfment. 
And it's funny that he that he thinks that love is like the greatest threat to this. And he actually follows this thread through his career as he goes on that, you know, the source of a lot of problems in people's adult life comes from not from just dysfunctional families, but actually from parents loving you because they engulf you and they destroy yourself and they consume it. Um, and they turn you into something for their, they, they consume you and, you know, excrete the thing that they want to see or something like that. Um, I, I just think it's, it's a very, it's very abstract. Um, it's really hard to actually relate it to a clinic, a clinical practice. Um, and, and maybe this would become clearer if I, if I op oppose it to petrification, it would it be all right if I moved on to that point. Okay. The, the petrification part, I think to me is the key to the piece. I think it's the most powerful section in the, in the book. What I think he's doing, and I think he is doing this because of his, because of his learning and because of some references he makes, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, is when he talks about the dread of petrification, and he mentions specifically, again, he brings up the, the fear of turning into a machine or an automaton. And I think that that's vital in a lot of, in a lot of different ways. The, the first is that I feel like he's drawing on a long tradition of um, you know, psychotic texts, you could call them, where the experience of turning into a machine or feeling like your environment is becoming increasingly machine-like or your behavior is becoming increasingly machine-like is a very powerful and long-standing tradition. The most famous one, of course, is Daniel Paul Schraber. The Memoirs of My Nervous Illness talks about mechanical birds twaddling, um, the automatic writing down machines, the torture devices that crush, crush your spine and make your head look like a pear, all these things. Uh, of course, there's Anna Kavan, the British writer who has some beautiful texts about the machinic birds in her head. Um, there's uh, James Tilly Matthews in, in Bedlam, who talks about the heirloom, uh, this this fantastical machine that he's stuck in uh, as an as an object, a manipulated object. And it's not even just in the texts of the mad themselves. This is like a big cultural trope. E.T.A. Hoffman, the Sandman, the you know the machine is a really important figure in that, and the fear that comes from seeing the machine. Victor Tausk, a psychoanalyst. Uh, around that same time, wrote a, an important text called "The Origin of the Influencing Machine in Schizophrenia." Uh, so this is like a really, in, uh, a really in long-standing tradition of thinking about schizophrenia and machines and becoming a machine, becoming a becoming an automaton in some way. But then, on the other hand, there's also this massive production of actual auto uh, automata uh, of machines. And thinking about them within the register of medicine or within the register of psychiatry. And this actually goes back all the way to Aristotle in the movement of animals. He compares, he says that, you know, humans have a lot of puppet-like movements where they just follow their compulsions. They have, they have thirst, they see a drink, they automatically drink. There's no distance. It's this automatic thing. And he's, he actually compares it to a puppet's existence. And he says animals are completely like puppets. And interestingly, and very importantly, he also says slaves are like moving machines and puppets. They're also autom automata. And then, of course, in the 16th, 17th century, you have Leibniz, Newton, Bacon, uh, Boyle, calling the world a, a, a massive automaton, a machine. Um, and this is transmuted into the medical world as well with the writing of Descartes, who talks about, you know, that famous image of the, the hand getting near the fire and it follows the animal spirits up and it causes a reaction in the body. You have the more radical Lemaitre, you have uh, Borelli, and then that first entered into psychiatry, arguably, with Thomas Willis, who talked about mental phenomenon as like a reflex mechanisms. I think this actually reached its apogee in... 19th century, late 19th century German psychiatric thought with Wilhelm Griesinger, who said that he's the guy who coined the phrase, all pathology, all uh, mental pathology is brain pathology. And he conceived of the brain as a, a reflex mechanism, like a muscle, like it, it has a stimuli and it reflects, it reacts like automatically to that stimuli, and then it feeds that thing back. So the reflex mechanism when you have a mad person in front of you is broken. And that's the meaning of madness is just this broken reflex, this broken contraction. And interestingly, Schreber's doctor was a student of Griesinger, uh, Emil Flakesig. And, you know, Schreber writes a lot about Flakesig, and Flakesig is trying to control Schreber and turn them into a machine and all this stuff. 
And what, what, where I'm going with all this and why I think this is so important is that you can read the history of these uh, accounts of feeling like turning into a machine, turning into an automaton as, of course, you can read them as just psychotic, you know, drab, dribble. It's just nonsense. It doesn't matter. On the other hand, you can see how this, the development of this, I, I don't want to call it an uh, uh, obsession, but the repeating of this motif over and over and over in all these different texts that are characterized as psychotic in relationship to the doctors who are in many ways, developing theories, psychiatric theories that are more and more machinic and characterizing the person as more and more machinic. And so what I think Lang is doing is saying that this psychotic experience, this petrification is not only understandable in common language, it doesn't only make sense by thinking of it in terms of the everyday and the, and the normal things that people can, can come across any time, but he further suggests that psychiatric theory has actually institutionalized this petrification. And he talks about like when he's talking about that patient, James, who's doing this pre petrification and, and telling Lang he's like a machine. Lang is like, yeah, this is like, this is deeply wrong and uncomfortable, but also it's what my, it's what my profession does professionally. This is what we do. We do exactly this thing. I think this is the point of his, his genius and his, his one thing that he can claim superiority over Freud that Freud, he, you know, he talks about how Freud went in the underworld and then he erected all these defenses. I think Freud was incapable of seeing this, seeing that this, that the psychotic world building is actually reflecting something that's happening on the surface of a specific encounter in the world, of a power relation. I mean, Foucault goes as far to say that it's that history of the detail that founds human sciences, that without uh, the Leibnizian foundation of the the sort of meticulous treatment and the observation of the detail without these processes you know napoleon doesn't get the standing army um you know and and the, in a certain sense one always has to wonder okay well we ask in philosophy why does the moral subject in in the kantian uh in the groundwork to the metaphysics of morals you know constitute a smiling prussian but at the same time, we also have to ask, why is it that every single patient constitutes the methodologies of preceding eras of, of psychiatry? And in a certain sense, it's, well, these subjects fall through apparatuses and, and like they, they are treated as such. And again, this is why I really think the treatment of Crapelin is fascinating because yes, we'll let the subject speak. And even if they tell us that if only we knew how right we were, right? That's the problem uh, that, that Crapelin can't quite get just how much, how correct uh, they are in their treatment of, because it's something that is just fundamentally productive. So I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. And I think my, desire to see petrification and engulfment overlapping in place just doesn't work at that level because i think that not only are they are they fundamentally opposed but like petrification is the very thing that lang himself is terrified of more than anything else in in this text is the concept of of it processes um, and the sort of factorial production that that goes on, and we get sort of the the cybernetics of James's uh, encounter with his his wife, um, and and to 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 Lang, it's it's terrifying, but yeah, it absolutely reflects the nature of some of what is going. And we still get this. There are treatments of affect theory now that echo some of this too, right? Um, and everything from you know liberal discourses on mental health to you know to con cybernetic hypothesis like this is this has perpetually been the the march that that has uh constituted the pos the conditions of possibility for uh the production of docile bodies and so on so it, it is important it's it's the very foundation of the way we understand subjects too i think that last bit too there about understanding is the foundation of how we understand docile bodies is also a point where Lang really shows his shortcomings too. Because in that tradition I, I outlined in, in rambly detail is 
the mad person was always conceived of as like a broken machine in many of these different texts and compared to animals. But the part that's always missing, at least missing in Lang's context, is that they also conceived of slaves and workers to be like broken or low machines or like animals. And Lang doesn't make that connection to, um, he, he, he does very well critiquing the, the condition of, of pr production of knowledge in the psychiatric field, but he does not relate that to what are the demands that produce this reification, this objectification or dehumanization of the person? What are the demands, uh, the broader demands that are producing the situation? And I think, you know, you could think about this also in terms of that last phrase in the section where he talks about how psychotherapy's task is to uh, is to assure freedom. I think it's a really beautiful passage. I like this concept of Lang's. Um, but I think, again, you can read this shortcoming back into it because he lo he he fails to locate the multifaceted sources of 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 one's unfreedom. He does very well talking about these intersubjective uh, encounters and the clinical the ways that unfreedom is demanded in clinical spaces. Um, so he understands the intersubjective very well, but he fails to recognize, I think, the exploitation and economic compulsion to the full extent that he could have. And in that gap of that failure between the intersubjective and the exploitation or the economic compulsions, I think he had to fill that gap with the kind of familialism that he fell he fell victim to in his late work because he had to he had to make some sort of account and because he could only see things uh through this immediate encounter of the family and the intersubjective experience he ended up just analogy analogizing everything with it and exploding it which is very different from for instance what like reich does reich creates a, a circuit between the economy and the family. And he talks about the, the different ways that that circuit is kept in, in motion and feeds from one to the other. Lang fails to conceive of the circuit. And instead, he just creates a mirror image of the family and society and says, you know, we can think about society in terms of the mirror image of the family. I think it's a, a, a huge shortcoming and his work could have been so much more if he had, <laughs> if he had seen that. I totally agree. I think I think it's a one-sided response to a one-sided methodology. I mean, it's depersonalization of psychiatry was responded to by hyperpersonalization of it. The limits of Lang are the limits of the theory of identity, because essentially he's trying to not simply prescribe identities to persons, but to integrate them into the processes of identification of becoming a subject. And fundamentally, the economic pressures, he said, that the means of subjectivation are not publicly nor in or you know, personally owned they are privately owned and the way he, he will simply you know, if, if you cannot seize those means then you know a, a subject a subject form will be given to you and in that sense the radical disruptiveness it's lost its potential because i mean is ontological security always a good thing do we want to grant ontological security to, you know to the, to the good german for example is is identity and its rigidity something we want to return to and this is something we can return to because the idea of um, selfhood as holding it in, as privacy, it seems to come from a bygone era. I mean, almost a nostalgic era when privacy was a thing. I mean, now it seems to be more of a, a, a kind of idea, at least in sort of more liberal, neoliberal, especially hyper sort of uh, interconnected, you know, very uh, internet integrated societies. It's, man it's mainly about managing the expenditure of oneself. Oneself is human capital from the outset. It's about, it's, I think there's a very sort of spectrum of Bataille in this. But fundamentally, it's not about holding yourself in and never sort of, you know, expending yourself. It's actually, we have the ecstasy that Lang sought. If anything, we have too much ecstasy channeled into circuits uh, themselves directed by the hegemonic forces of capital institutions that support it. And that's a lot of security. Really, it keeps us constrained within identities which ultimately cannot be autonomous other than as sort of the, the logics of those identities which themselves come from a completely alien source and a completely alien and capricious source which we don't really know how to take back for ourselves in order to have a self that's worth having i mean obviously ontological security is in many senses just very desirable i mean the force given forces you know imposter your imposterization that try to invalidate certain identities but at the same time Onshore security is the hegemony of common consent as to the validity of an identity. Do we need this hegemony to validate us? It's like, you know, 
I exist, I exist, and then there's a third person like, are you forgetting to ask capital? I don't consent to your existence. This is the limits of validity and limits of identity because it's such a rigid, uncomprehended film of identity as barely processed, most custom, and even more than that, a rigid form of self-identification. I guess the, I guess the final question, I guess, is ontological security, is it as valuable as it was today as it was for Lang then? And people weren't human capital as much back in those days, because at least it, Lang was talking to some people who had a, in Britain, very strong welfare state. You could be born into a, a state-controlled council house, and you weren't, you had sort of had the uh, original, I guess you would call it the ethical life of the family, and then you left and went into civil society, although it's economic domain to private property. You learned how to be a private property holder, then you went into civil society, did your economics, you know, did, did your private property transactions. Now, the economic circumstances, the material circumstances have completely changed. And do, are these, what are the values of these you know, Langian values of the self and the psychiatric process? Mm, that's a really good question. And I don't know. I don't know. I think it's an open question whether the Langian analytic works anymore. Um, as you as you laid it out, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it does. Like, I still think that there's a validity in the descriptive elements, both in this text and the politics of experience, right? Like anyone who has spent any time with like a clinician, even yesterday knows that that the the processes of i guess you know depersonalization of the clinical subject is still a problem um like your nurse is not really your friend <laughs> um but the 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 problem too about this is like but this this is maybe i think it's like three or four years before becker's human capital is published and that concept in liberal and neoliberal discourses becomes like the foundation for like an economic project uh, at the level of investment in bodies, right? Um, where there's a paradigm shift uh, sort of already as Taylorism is coming into formation away from it <laughs> at the same time. So yeah, I think that there's there's an open question as to how helpful um, this is. The problem for me though, is that I, I see no value in this fullness or definitive continuity of the ontologically secure man because i still think it relies on a sovereign unified subject and i always think that that's going to to reify the exact same problems that end up with going as far back as like aristotle's arguments for natural slavery and i i still think that this concept of one's assured validity in themselves and this ability to access the real that is a a communal real Right, that is a unified, uh, a unified, accessible like metaphysical space that a circumscribed constituency all has access to is going to constitute an exclusion just at the act of establishing it. And once we start doing that, well, we've already replicated the logic of of the leper houses, um, and I, I think Lang. Lang still wants to be a like Lang still wants to be a clinical psychiatrist. That I I think that that's the core problem. And look, maybe that's like funda maybe that's fundamentally anti medicalist of me to just say like that's my problem with it. But it is that like that's what it comes down to for me. Um, and while I have a, a deep sympathy, I I think particularly Sasha's treatment of of um, of petrification leaves. So much uh, for us to 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 chew to chew over, but as we get as we close, and honestly, I think like that's the, the peak of this discussion and the primary problem here too. Um, as we come to a close, uh, I just want to remind everyone to to take a look at unsoundmind.org, and we're going to have all of Sasha's work in the show notes, so uh, no worries about that. But is there anything that anyone would like any comments that anyone would like to make in closing? No, besides thank you so much for having me on. It was it's a delight. Amazing to have you. We'll definitely we will definitely have you you back on to discuss specifically something of yours. So uh I won't discuss we'll, we'll ambush so you bad. with that uh in the so future. bad. So, so yeah, I'd be very happy to.
Okay, Civil War coming up soon. And I'm just going to end it off on a question to the listener, really, sort of, I think, to sort of round off our discussion in terms of ontological security, it's about how we think about security. Are you secure in your ontological, your ontological home in the world because a, a tribunal of medical, judicial, economic reason, you know, are, are you secure as a private property holder on the plane of ontology? Or can we be secure in new ways in terms of occupying that space and holding our own against the bastards who dared? If the tribunal has to give you your ontology, is it you who's doing the ontologizing? Is it you who's doing the being, I guess? Do we need an ontological civil war before we can start doing ontology again? Unleash the Langian war machine, destroy the ontological human security system. Good night. <laughs>